Hello and welcome to the first Sintel the Game tutorial. It's been one of our goals for a long time to share some of the tips and tricks we've picked up while working on the game, but with most of the little free time we have being spent working on Sintel the Game, we haven't always been able to share as much with you guys as we would have liked. But to say a big thank you for all the support we've received, we thought we'd better change that and get some new content out there. So as you may have guessed by now, this video is going to be all about low poly plants. Specifically, we'll be looking at some workflow ideas to help speed up what can sometimes seem like quite a laborious task. We'll take a look at creating fully 3D low res versions of a plant inside of Blender. We'll then use that 3D data to save ourselves some time when making 2D versions for use on image cards. Finally, we'll check out some more advanced material settings to help get the most out of our low poly geometry. Anyway, I think that's enough of an intro, so let's jump into Blender and get started. Straight out of the box, we have a few different starting points in Blender. We could choose to use one of the plugins, such as the Ivy Generator or Sapling Maker, both of which are good, however if you have a very specific idea in mind for the type of plant that you wish to create, or you simply need something that's very optimised for in-game, then there really is no substitute for hand modelling. When modelling a plant, it's very tempting to define the shape of the leaves and petals with geometry, but because of the sheer volume of them on most plants, it's best to use the geometry purely as texture support, and later on we'll see how the texture can really help define the details. One of the most efficient methods I've found for creating plants is to start by creating small component parts, a leaf, flower, stem, and so on, then duplicating and moving these components into place to create the final model. It's usually best to UV these master component parts before we begin duplication. Most of these parts won't have their shape altered much after duplication, so UV stretching really isn't a big deal, and occasionally a little bit of stretch can create some nice non-uniformity. Because these master components will be duplicated many times, it's useful to keep them as low resolution as possible. However, having said that, if you do intend on doing any sort of animation with the object later on, then you do still need to leave enough geometry there to support deformations.
Once all of the master components have been completed, it's a good idea to combine them all into one object. That way we can arrange the UV so that they will not overlap in the final model. All of the duplicates that we create from these master components from now on will share the same UV space, so getting these master components laid out at an early stage can really save us a lot of hassle. Now that all the basics are made and we have some UVs, rather than continue to build the plant, guessing what it may or may not look like with the texture on it, I like to go ahead and paint one. It's up to you at this point whether you create the final texture or just a preliminary one to help you with modelling. So this is the final texture that I came up with for this particular plant. I'm not really going to go into the texturing process since it's all pretty standard hand painting stuff and the approach you will take when creating a texture will differ depending on the type of plant that you wish to create. For instance, if you're going for a more realistic result, then photo-based texturing may be a better way to go than hand painting. One thing I would like to point out though, is how I've dealt with the alpha channel. For this particular texture, I have used a PNG file format because it can support an embedded transparency. However, if you're using something like a standard JPEG, you will need to paint a separate map for the object's alpha. We will be using the alpha channel almost like a cookie cutter, so everywhere that is transparent in the texture will also be transparent in the object, helping us achieve a complex looking shape without the need for lots of geometry. Now we have a texture in place, the real fun can begin. Simply duplicate, move, rotate and scale the components into place until you find something that you like.
Once you reach a stage where you're happy with the look of your plant, it's a good idea to do a final sweep, for extra vertices and faces that can now be removed or merged because they are no longer visible. Remember, since almost all of the detail is coming from the texture, it's very easy to create many variations on the same design just by altering something as minor as the colour of the texture. Combine this with changes to the placement of components and you can rapidly build up a large variety of different looking plants. So now that we have all of this wonderful 3D data, we may as well use it to create our 2D texture as well. So to do this we can simply take an OpenGL render of our viewport. This will give us both a nicely rendered image and an alpha channel to use for an image card. If however you'd like to take it a step further, why not adjust the materials so that they'll work either in the Blender internal render engine or inside of Cycles so that you can get an even better render. Just ensure that you get an alpha channel for it as well. Before we conclude this video, let's just take a look at creating a double-sided material inside of Blender. Double-sided materials take the geometry's normal direction into account and allow us to do things like having two different textures applied to either side of a single face. This can be useful for all kinds of things, but in the case of low poly plans, it allows us to have one texture for the top side of the leaf and another for the underside, all without the need for extra geometry. So just to demonstrate this as easily as possible, we'll create the double sided material on this plane. To create the basic setup for a double sided material, we'll need to create a new material and set it to use nodes. We'll change the colour of this first material node to be a nice solid blue, just so that we can see what we're doing. Next we'll add another material node and colour that something different, just to make things clear. Hmm, what a hideous combination. Anyway, we'll also need a mix node, so stick that in there and connect its colour to the output node. And connect the two materials into the colour 1 and 2 ports of the mix node. Next we will need a colour ramp. Stick the output of the colour ramp into the factor of the mix node. This is what will drive which side of the plane gets which colour. After that, grab a geometry node. Now if we were rendering this in the Blender internal render engine, we could get the effect that we're looking for simply by using the front and back output of this node. But alas, that doesn't currently work in the game engine. The last node that we'll need is a vector math. Drop that in there and connect the view and normal from the geometry node into the vector math inputs. Change the vector math operation to a dot product. And stick the result into the color ramps factor. With a few final adjustments of the colour ramp, we have our double sided material. Bear in mind you will need to be looking through a camera for this effect to work. And with that, I think we've reached the end of this video. I know I've breezed quite quickly through the steps involved in creating low poly plants, but I hope you found it interesting. Be sure to check the SintelGame.org website for all the info related to the game. You can also find us on Twitter at SintelGame. Thanks for watching and I look forward to seeing your low poly plant creations. <laughs>